term in conservation that most of you know, and it's called the keystone species. And a keystone species is a species upon which all the other species around it depend. And in the world of conservation biology, when you pull out the keystone species, everything else tends to unravel. And for the North Pacific arc, from California to Korea, the keystone species are wild salmon. So they're important far beyond their importance just because they're a beautiful species, but they're critical to the health of the food webs. And they're also critical to the health of the economy. So this issue goes beyond biodiversity. Basically, what we've learned in, 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 in looking back at the 200 years of, of management of salmon and really thousands of years is that we've been very hard for people to sustain salmon runs. And we've learned that if you really want to have salmon in 100 years, the best strategy is to identify your last best places and make sure you don't lose them. The cost of restoration is very high, but if we can get ahead of the curve and save our last best, we've got a shot at saving these beautiful fish and all the things that they support. We're in a window of time now. The salmon situation is very bad in some places, but there's tremendous opportunity. And our generation has the chance to get this right. And if we do get it right, it'll be a tremendous legacy. And that opportunity is something I'll describe right now. So why don't I get the, uh, can, it, can, it, can everybody hear me okay in the back? And, yeah. Okay. So this is the distribution of Atlantic salmon across the Pacific Rim. And I don't know if you can see this, but there's a red line all right. <laughs> I'll let you put it back. <laughs> okay, there's the laser right there. This is the edge of the uh, this is the edge of the marine distribution right here, and there's the edge of the freshwater penetration of wild salmon. You can see the huge impact they have across the whole northern Pacific Rim. They're everywhere. And furthermore, they're the symbol of the Northern Pacific Rim, and they're what ties us to our neighbors in Canada and Japan and Russia. People may not know about ecosystems in Japan and in a lot of places in the U.S., but they love salmon, so strategically it's a powerful species. Now, basically, I mentioned salmon are the key to the food webs. If you look at the species of the North Pacific, they eat salmon. If you take salmon out, the ecosystems are very vulnerable. Bears depend on salmon. Killer whales, the caddisflies, the movement of marine nutrients into the watersheds, science is showing, is the major driver of the health of the rivers that flow into the North Pacific. By themselves, they're not that productive, but with this huge marine nutrient subsidy, it's what drives them. And so they're very important biologically. Now, I mentioned there are keystone species. More and more species we find are directly dependent upon wild salmon. It's also economically very important. Now, wild salmon has lost market share to farm-raised salmon, about 70%, but there's still, we, between recreational and commercial on both sides, it's a, it's a $5 billion industry, and it's a major source of economic employment on the coast. From a cultural standpoint, it's also very important because people, native peoples, the first salmon is a ceremony that brings people and all both sides of the Pacific Rim is a central aspect of native communities. It's a cult cultural icon and there's a saying in, in the Pacific Northwest that the Pacific Northwest is basically any place a salmon can get to. So they're really important. Now this, is, this map I'm gonna, is an important map. This describes the current health of salmon runs for biodiversity and for abundance. Now what we've seen is in Europe, wild salmon runs have been pounded, and I don't know if we're ever gonna get them back at meaningful levels, basically south of Norway. On the east coast of the United States, salmon are just a tiny remnant of their historic abundance. We're seeing declines in Canada. California has lost salmon runs dramatically. Most of the salmon runs south of the Alaska border are on the Endangered Species Act. Our runs south of Canada are at less than 5% of historic abundance. And, but we're not willing to let them go. People are fighting hard to recover what we can. Our last best shot in this geography is to find our strongholds and protect them while we still can. South of Canada, if we don't do it in our generation, there'll be no reruns, there'll be no second chances. Salmon runs are very expensive to try to restore. In the Pacific Northwest, we've spent billions of dollars on salmon restoration because people love these fish so much. But the restoration is really tough and there's been no clear, clear wins on the restoration front. Now maybe we'll get there, but it, what we've learned is it's a lot cheaper to protect them proactively than to try to bring them back later. Basically, uh, Japan has 
lost their wild salmon runs, their healthy wild salmon runs. We found a few rivers in Hokkaido that are still have decent runs. We're seeing declines working their way north along the coast of the Sea of Japan and Sakhalin. Um, I'll, I'll return to some of the issues here. And basically, the world's most important centers of salmon production are Bristol Bay in Alaska and Russia's Kamchatka Peninsula account for over half of all world salmon production today. So we absolutely have to be able to make sure that we don't lose those important stocks. Now this is a fish bypass system in the Columbia Basin that cost $260 million. Again, we have to invest some of this money in proactive efforts to keep the bad things from happening to these rivers. It's less controversial and less expensive to do something early instead of trying to put it back together later. Now what we've done is we've worked with our partners in all the nations of the Pacific Rim and we've identified the 96 rivers that represent the most important strongholds for wild salmon left uh, anywhere and we've distributed them to try to capture the different varieties of salmon, the different ecosystems. These 96 rivers represent over 70 percent of the world's remaining salmon production. If we can be smart and, and be proactive and work in partnership with local communities, we can, get the, we can protect these places. And especially if we can support the salmon markets and the commercial fishermen that are, that are eating salmon. I don't know if, if you've noticed, we should have wild salmon on every menu and every restaurant in, in uh, Washington, D.C. because that will be key to sustaining the health of these fish. Now, I'd like to uh, describe, zoom in, because this is an international forum on the Russian Far East which is today the most substantial conservation opportunity for wild salmon in just sheer scale. Now, Russia under the Soviet Union was, uh, development was, was restricted, and these areas are, most of them are as pristine as they have been for the last thousand years. And just in the last, since 1990, the doors have opened and there's been a rush to develop the natural resources of the Russian Far East. Now, we have a chance to work with our Russian partners and say, you know, we've done some things right and we've made some mistakes. Let's help you learn from our mistakes and maybe we can make, you know, you can do it better. And if they do it better and they're able to hang on to some of these systems, it, it'll be a gift, it will be a gift to the world because they're not making any more of these salmon rivers. Um, what I'm going to do next is show you some of these places, but before I do, I'll just point out uh, this is the end of the Aleutian chain. This is Russia's Kamchatka Peninsula, which is about the size of California, has less than half a million people in it. These are watersheds where we have projects going in the watersheds. This is Sakhalin Island right here, which is, um, Chekhov wrote, you know, the island, and it's a long and very important area for salmon and biodiversity. This is the Sea of Japan where the Siberian tigers coexist with salmon runs and strange and beautiful species called taimen. And of course, there's Hokkaido. So now I'll show you some pictures, and I'm going I'm to stop talking for a second, just let you take in the beauty. You can fly a helicopter for five hours across this landscape and not see a trace of human life. I mean, it really is like going back into a time machine. And we've had some amazing success in the Russian Far East, and I, I'd like to describe it. That's a small one. So what we did in, in the Russian Far East, it took us a long time to build the relationships and build the trust. 
But we did it, and we did it through science. We had scientists in the United States coming over to Russia, meeting up with the Russian partners. We've done research expeditions to these rivers. What is provided for the Americans is a chance really to go into a time machine and understand what our rivers look like 200 years ago. And they've taken that information and used it to develop restoration strategies. And it's also built a foundation. And now we really have an international partnership to help protect these fish. If we can link what the Russians are doing and help them link with what we're doing, we'll have a chance of, of being effective. Uh, we've built biological stations on rivers. Uh, this is the Coal River, which we think uh, is one of the most productive rivers in the planet. This river has pink, chum, sockeye, coho, chinook, Asian masu salmon or cherry salmon, steelhead, rainbow trout, and two species of char. And the runs are, are like Alaska. They're incredibly productive and diverse. But it's been very interesting. We've got, now we've got Russian officials flying out to the camp and, and they're proud of what we've been able to do with our Russian partners. And uh, the research teams are there, are there every summer. This summer, uh, there'll be people reporting on this in popular media. Now, let me briefly describe the threats. Everything that's happened over the last 150 years may happen over the next, for us, may happen over the next 20 in the Russian Far East. They've got an epidemic of poaching of, of illegal fishing, which is, it's, it's very much like the Wild West over there. And that, th they'll be able to surmount that challenge. But it is a challenge today. But I believe it's one that can be, that can be uh, dealt with. And most of the poaching is to, get, to collect the caviar for the caviar row market. Uh, the second challenge is, is going to be natural resource development. Now, this map shows Kamchatka, and there's the Sea of Ohotsk, there's Sakhalin Island, and the green patches are oil and gas um, concessions. And one of the biggest deposits of oil and gas in the world is in the Sea of Ohotsk. It's strategically important for this nation and, of course, for Asia. If our position is we're not going to try to stop oil and gas projects, but we can work with those industries and with the Russian government to help them do the best job possible. Now, the strategic issue is this, this salmon runs and the marine areas here, this is the second most productive marine environment in the world. The yield of protein per square uh, kilometer of ocean is through the roof with many species. So it's a global security issue on fish protein as well as it is an a, a energy issue. So, we, the goal, of course, is to responsibly develop energy, but also not to, not to damage the protein factory that's going to feed Asia for the next uh, 100 years. This is a strategic challenge, and it's a strategic, strategic opportunity. But we've been able to build relationships with the oil companies, and this is a picture on Sockland Island. Most of you know about the integrated Sockland II oil and gas project. It's a $22 billion effort with Shell, and now Gazprom is the major owner. We went to Shell and we said, look, let's, let's help you implement a salmon conservation program in partnership with the state government to help get it right on Sakhalin. You can't undo the damage that's going to happen to some of the rivers, but we can basically work with them. And so we've been on the front page of the local Sakhalin paper four times in the last six months. And this is the, the head of Sakhalin Energy, and that's the governor, and that's me. And we actually got the fishermen and the environmentalists and the oil, uh, the energy companies all around the table talking about this program, which is called the Sockland Salmon Initiative. I think we can do this more. If we don't do this, we risk losing a lot. And so it's a key opportunity. Now finally, let me just say, the last 15 months we've seen some huge breakthroughs in the Russian Far East. In Sakhalin, this governor is willing to move ahead with five whole watershed protected areas, top to bottom. And we're not talking about just salmon this will benefit. This will benefit a lot of other species. And then in Kamchatka, the local governor announced it took, we, we've created one half a million acre protected area. Now he wants to do five more. It'll be a total of nine whole watersheds, top to bottom, protected forever, over six million acres. We've got more, act, more activity on the Russian Far East Coast. The whole package would be something like 16 whole watersheds. If the Russians do this, It'll be the biggest habitat win for salmon in 20 years. It's a historic opportunity. We can play a powerful role by supporting the Russians and those local governors helping to do this. It's in their interest and it's also in our interest in the global community. And if you love eagles and bears and whales and you like fish, uh, there's, not, there's not any more big deals like this that are going to come around the, the corner. And th this is where you can see it from Kamchatka. These are the watersheds. That big rainbow came from the Zhupanova, which has some of the best rainbow trout fishing uh, anywhere. 
And it's a beautiful place. It's worth, it's worth coming. It's like the lost world of volcanoes and everything else. So finally, in summary, our conservation strategy that we're asking for your help and advice on to implement has three basic pieces. The first is we've got to protect the habitat. History's shown that once you lose that, you, it's really pretty tough to get back. Protect the habitat while you still can. Protect the habitat while the fishermen are still with you wanting to protect that habitat. The second is support wild salmon markets. As long as there's economic incentives and activity around the wild salmon, people will fight for them. And the people benefit and the bears benefit and all the species they support. The third is the power of the exchanges and the learning network and the partnerships has been, has been remarkable. And so what we can do, we believe that this should all be linked in a, in a network with possibly a training center where Russians and Americans and the Japanese and the Canadians are actually working together and trading management strategies and information. One of the Achilles heels of salmon conservation has been we keep making the same mistakes over and over again, first in Europe, then in the East Coast, then California, Japan. But if we, we can get ahead of that curve, and we have to, and we, we can do it through trading information. So that is my last slide. Why don't I just, I think I'll leave it on that last image and say that I, I'm asking for your help and I'm asking for your support. And if everyone in this room, I mean, if the people in this room, we can do it. And it will be a tremendous legacy. It'll be something that will foster economic partnerships in the North Pacific. It'll help biological diversity and it'll help food webs. It'll help people that depend on salmon and it'll help native people who, spiritual, uh, who, who believe and worship these fish. And we've got the window. We have the chance. And, and I think we can do it. And, I'm, and, I'm, and I appreciate your help. And thank you. <laughs>